Skeptic, it's Justin Nielsen here, along with my weekly guest, Arusha Paris. He is an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager, and our special guest this week is Anne Marie Band. She is the author of the Trading Book. Uh, you know, one of our one of our favorite guests on IBD Live. She's always giving us these levels and um, you know support levels and resistance levels. Plus, I should also add that Anne Marie, you're now contributing some content for us on the option side. So that's something that if you want to hear more from her or at least read more from her, you can check that out at investors.com under research and options. But uh, we, we were talking a lot about the market. And one thing we didn't get to was kind of the levels that you look, you're looking at right now, Anne-Marie, because I, I really respect those levels that you set up. So for the S&P 500, you mentioned that we got above that, that December 13th high of 4,100. Um, what what's next what what are you looking at next uh, are you looking at another level for it to breach uh, above or a level of support that you'd like to see it hold and if it doesn't then we could be in trouble well you know what you hit it right on the nail so the the key thing when you're looking at a chart like this right what is your very small moving average i see there what is uh, that um th there's that uh one? There, there's uh, 10 a, months. See the a, big one. a 10 month yeah and a 50. okay so the quicker so one that, is the 10 month yep. yeah so if we look at that 10 we're going to see that it's down to flat right in the space that we're looking at and so what we're also seeing is that we have clear power from underneath because we're making higher lows Mm -hmm. Right. And if we take a look down at the volume area, you can see that we've got it's similar, but the two months that moved up were just a shy bit down versus the um, the downward months, the months that ended red. And so really, when I look at something like this, I think to myself, OK, what are the traders actually thinking about? And what they're thinking about is, okay, am I going to stall out here or am I going to break out? And so everybody's going to be watching what tomorrow looks like from about 41.35. So we closed at 41.19, pulled back off of the highs. And tomorrow, what the traders are going to be thinking about is, can I hold this or am I going to give some back? Now, the first thing that I like to do in a space like this is look at that flat moving average and say, what does a flat moving average mean? It means that there are just as many readings under that line as above that line in terms of the price and volume. If you're just looking at a simple moving average, it's just that price. And so when you look at something like that, think to yourself, hmm, the probability that I break out and stay out is not as high as the probability I break out and come back in. A flat moving average, if you take a look at every moving average that you see that flattens out, if you fail, like, let's see, if, let's go back to maybe December. If we look at December a little bit more closely, we can see that right there, as it turns over, it moves up and down through that line, mm -hmm. up and down through it before it decides to move in the other direction, right? And so, and I think that might have been, uh, yeah, right there. So we are going to expect that if it breaks out, it pulls back. And if it pulls back and holds a higher low, we've got ourselves upside. And that upside for the next path is probably all the way at 4,300. Now, okay. is is that something that we can buy and just hold? Absolutely not. Because that 10 has got a downward drift on it. Remember that 10 is weighing the things that are closest to price action that's just occurred. 
and the probability of something behaving right near those lines is much higher than it behaving to the 50, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a key thing that I look at. So on the upside, 43, but what I expect is a blow off top here that rises and then fades. So if you buy a breakout here, Tomorrow it opens up and it looks really great. And you buy that level. Think about where you're going to get out because it seems very likely from a formation perspective that it's going to give you a wick there before it gives you a body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So w given that, you know, I, I think you kind of already gave the instruction a little bit here that um is this buy and hold you know uh no not necessarily and exactly. and so like maybe maybe we can get into a little bit of how you do handle this um again when is it time to be patient with your positions um that you do hold you know that you are holding and give mm -hmm. them the room to run um you know which is not something we've been doing lately because the trends have been so short and yes. so you know <laughs> it's basically they, they've been almost non-existent that by the time you get the strength it's like done uh yeah. so let's contrast that with um kind of this 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 flip side of holding on to cash for too long where if you've got too much cash then you're not participating um so it's it's you know, gosh, you know, pick your poison. So how do you make that decision? Where, where do you apply your patience? So that's a really great question. And it's not always straightforward. But for me, if I've been in an uptrend, mm -hmm. and I come to an event, and I say, hey, listen, I want to buy x, y, or z, right? I'm not going to wait for a breakout. Because I believe that I'm in a downward trend and I believe I'm in a downward trend because my tight moving average on the monthly is downward. Mm -hmm. And if it flattens, it's telling me, hang on, you need to watch support. As long as it holds support, you're fine. So what does that actually mean if we translate it into buying or execution in the market? For me, I wait until it comes into that floor and I go, that's my least risk. I'm mm -hmm. buying it there because I've already got the strength. I know what the composite rating is. I know where it is on the industry charts. I know how it looks from flow. And so I say, you know, that looks good, but I'm going to wait for a nasty day for it to come in so that I can buy it there. And let's say you do that, but all of a sudden it takes fire and it completely blasts out. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting looking at it and it's on the rise. Again, you go back to that 10, that very tight average, and you say, okay, is it moving up? What's my last area of support? That's going to be my floor. That's going to be my risk. I'm going to try and get as close to that, and then I'm going to get in. So it's never about, you know, I had a terribly tough time <clears throat> in 2020 because I'm this person that always waits for the pullback. Uh -huh, right. <laughs> Guess what? And the pullback was not there. Never came. <laughs> Yeah. Or I maybe you had one the, day. <laughs> yeah. And if you didn't left, if you didn't load up that day, then it was It done. left me yeah. in the dust all yeah. the time. I was just pulling my hair out. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of mechanic that I really enjoy because it's patience driven. And the patience is if trend is in your favor. If you're short and you continue to make lower highs, trends in your favor. Mm -hmm. If you stop doing that or you stop heading lower, then you go, I got to take some profit. And the same thing here for going to the upside. Yeah, it's breaking out, but there's a general weakness, a general fear and greed that swings back and forth so often that we simply have to go, you know what? I know it's probably just two, three days away. I'm just going to wait for the next fade. And then I'm going to get involved, which is really 
what we've done with a number of these option trades mm -hmm. uh, that I've been able to participate in. We've just had some good fortune and patience to go, you know what, let's wait this out just a wee bit. And once it happens, it'll, it'll uh, put you in the trade. And really, you know, patience has been a superpower that I've had to develop because I am a very impatient person. I so terribly impatient. You can ask any of my kids. They're like, oh gosh, don't. No. Yeah, she's terrible. And it bled into the market. And so I would say things like, I know this is going up. I'm just buying it here. It doesn't matter. It's, I mean, I know it might come down, but, and I'm not really hyper-focused on where's my risk. Because listen, if you don't focus on where your risk threshold is, you're going to end up upside down in something that is going to knock you for a loop. I mean, mm -hmm. it'll make you just, it'll take your breath. Right. right. Because now, you like, will not have expected it. Yeah. So now obviously every strategy, every approach in the market is going to have its strengths and weaknesses. And so yes. where is there a kind of area, some kind of signal that tells you that this is not kind of going back to like that 2020 where that wasn't necessarily your environment. Uh, was there a point where it forced you to either change the strategies and maybe switch more towards breakouts versus pullbacks? Uh, and, it, and if so, if not at that point, have you taken something like that from 2020 just in case oh, the same thing happens? Definitely. Definitely. I'll answer the last part first. Okay. I definitely did. And here's the simple hack. If you're looking at a daily chart and you've got something like a 10 sitting up there, if it doesn't come back to test it, you're probably sitting in the right direction if that 10 has got slope. What I realized the 10, was... 10-day moving average. You're, you're yes. Saying, yes. Mm -hmm. If it's got... If it looks like it would be a great roller coaster to either crest up and then move down or vice versa, get in and just use that 10 as your support zone. Okay. Just mm -hmm. use it as your support zone. You'll be able to stay long or trim and just continue up until it breaks below. And then, you know, as soon as it goes back up, you buy it again. Mm -hmm. That's excellent if you don't have something that's going like this. If it's got nice, clean slope, whether it's very steep or just slightly steep, mm -hmm. you're going to have a wonderful go at it if you just follow that. And that really was 2020. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that thing yeah. just, oh, I was so annoyed. I, I can't <laughs> even tell you. And yeah. people were making money hand over fist. Right. And I was sitting there going, you know, this isn't ordinary. <laughs> My glasses on, trying to sound important. Yeah, it was just, you know, you. it took me until about July to go, listen, you got to change tack. Yeah. You just, you got to change tack. Stop, because everything's leaving you into the dust or you're getting stopped out because you're sitting in the wrong position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, that I mean, really is it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even like for for our strategy, I, I know Justin can talk about this too. It, in two thousand and nine, even though we we had our kind of signals to get in the market, it was just off a little bit. It was going up on lower volume. It, it just mm -hmm. did not seem like the other rallies that were you know that happened before two thousand nine. And I think it took a lot of us who were used to the previous pre two thousand nine type of rallies to adjust right? right but we were forced to adjust and say you know what maybe volume isn't always going to come in to to the markets anymore uh, and and so you kind of had to adapt to it i don't know just if you had any comments on that well and you also had kind of that disconnect to a degree where the indexes were doing one thing but growth yeah. stocks were doing yes. another for the last few months exactly. it was yep. you know and we've talked about this before it was you know bank of america 
down at a dollar and Ford and Citigroup and all of these big, you know, heavyweights that were Crazy. trading in single digits, um, you know, yeah. doing reverse yes. splits so they don't get delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, you know, it was them bouncing, you know, and again, just a few points. But when you're a dollar stock, I mean, yeah. a few points is uh, that, that's Monstrous. quite a bit of percentage, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah it was a, a very, very odd market. Um, but now, uh, Amory, you, you're, you're kind of talking about the 10 the day here. Um, uh -huh. What what kind of what kind of time frame is this uh, ideal for? I mean, you know, is this for kind of shorter term traders that are doing swing trades, um, or you know, is this something that people that are kind of going for trades that last a month or two or longer um, is the ten day too short to kind of use that um, type That's of type of uh, position? That's a very good sizing? question. Um, here is the here's the answer I would propose. It could be too short of a time frame if you have a stock that has a general variability about it, right? If you look at the ATR, uh, mm -hmm. the average true range right. for a stock, and it has this habit of continually coming in and testing its 14-day or whatever, every stock has a little yeah. bit of a different vibe because of the types of entities that trade it, mm -hmm. right? So you look at something like Tesla that's got a massive amount of volatility. If you use a 10 on that, you know, you're out every other day because yeah. it's coming in and hitting it or, or whatever until you, you know, get the big move like it's had over the last little bit. So the space is this what i just heard both of you say is hey listen you know we just had to adapt and that is really the mark of excellence that you find for someone that lasts a long time in this industry you look at something and you go hmm that's odd i need to keep my eyes on it see if it's telling me something else if it's not telling me something else then you know what, I'll go back to what I'm thinking. But if I see something developing, I have to change tack. And so if you begin with a 10, just look to the past and go, wow, does that, that breaks that a lot. Let me put it on a 10 weekly and see if it breaks the 10 weekly a lot. And if it doesn't, then you go, okay, I'm comfortable with that pullback. And if it pulls back like that, I'll know what to do right there. And as long as you listen to the story that the candlesticks are telling you, and I know that sounds silly, but they do, they tell you a story. It's a very immersive storyline that you get from what managers are doing, what uh, pension funds are doing, what anybody's doing in these spaces. And so, oh, speaking of which, something else that might push us a little further north, pension funds are overfunded for the first time in mm. a little bit. And so there's money to deploy there also that could push the market a little bit higher. But again, it's an individual space. For me, I trade the SPY and the futures every day. So as I'm looking at that, I will use raw price to tell me, hey, I'm going to look at the next, th the last three candles, and I'm going to see, am I, am I looking? That, are things moving higher, low, higher, high? I'm going to go long on the first pullback into any kind of candlestick formation because all I'm doing is measuring risk. You know, the more times we engage with the market, the more times we're there to potentially get it wrong, and right. so you want to find those spaces. <laughs> Where you can go in and go, oh, okay, that's it. But we sort of fight that battle with, well, I got to do something. I'm right here. And it's not, it comes back to that, hey, listen, can you take a deep breath and go, you know, I'm going to wait for it to come yeah. to me. We've got to be the child in the butterfly garden, as it were, in terms of, of uh, price action. Mm -hmm. And and to that end, I, I should mention that some of the content that you've been uh, writing lately for IBD has you know focused sometimes on the the cash secured puts where you're like okay this is the price that I wanted at 
let me just sell exactly. a put and yeah. you know that gives me the opportunity to buy it when it comes down to the price that i want um you know and, and, and or different. take the money for selling it because it right. never comes back it never right? comes there so, so you just okay well yeah. i'll just uh i'll just pocket that money Paid to so. wait <laughs> right yeah. so again kind of getting back to that that patience <laughs> idea um you know it's there, there there's a lot of different ways to to apply that now uh should you apply some patience with your mechanics um i guess how long do you do you wait before kind of deciding okay i have to shift because uh, i think sometimes a lot of people suffer from um kind of their strategy drift where yes. they're always chasing the strategy that they think is working right now and you know if you don't stick with anything you can't kind of you're exactly. all over the place you're you're trying exactly. to become a jack of all trades master of none so how much patience should you give to the mechanics of your strategy before you say, wait a minute, I need to make an adjustment? So in another punt, I will say it depends <laughs> on the strength of strategy. Yes. So if you have a one of my favorite strategy, answers, by the way, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a very simple strategy, like a 1030 moving average cross, mm -hmm. that unless you're in markets that are very heavily trending, you're going to have a coin toss in terms of whether it works or it doesn't. <clears throat> if you have something that's based on price and volume, which is what I believe are the two strongest things that help um, give us mechanical flow, it's very simple. I'm looking at two things. I'm mm -hmm. looking at price and I'm looking at volume. Now we can have blow off tops in volume and that means we have to pay attention to follow through, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really is, I like to give every trade three to four candles of motion mm -hmm. as long as they are not breaking primary support if I'm long or primary resistance if I'm short. For a price to break my support level it's telling me that buyers came in and then couldn't hang on mm -hmm. and sellers pushed them out so yeah. why is that so i'll go to volume and i'll go oh look volume is really thin here let me see what happens tomorrow if tomorrow it comes in and i have continuation and i break my low I have to leave. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you'll get a wick down if you have a hard stop. It'll shake you out and the next day, you know, it's back to cool runnings or whatever, right? right? Yeah. So what is it with me in the John Candy movies? Right? <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm thinking Candy. Jamaica and bobsledding now. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so the thought process is always try to make it simple, but powerful, right? It's like E equals MC squared. Yeah. That's a very simple equation. It's extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And you got to have a master's degree in math to figure <laughs> right. out how to derive it. At least. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, yeah. but, the, but the basis of that is... A equals B times C or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And that's really what we have to do with trading. We can have things that give us ancillary support, relative strength over a long term, uh, break of a moving average. But averages never really give you what individual pinpoints can give yes. you. I'll right. give you a little example. When the, when the Navy was building the cockpit mm -hmm. for the, do you guys know this story? For the F-14, they said, all right, let's just go out there and measure every pilot. We're going to mm -hmm. measure the width, the span. We're going to measure the length of their arms. We're going to, I mean, 50 measurements. Mm -hmm. And they got an average and they built a cockpit for that average person, guess what? <laughs> it didn't fit one man, <laughs> not right. one man. Uh -huh. And so that was a billion dollar project for them to go, wait, 
averages are not what I need to look at when I'm working for precision. Yeah. But what they do give me is a range of motion. Hey, listen, we can't really fit a guy bigger than six, five in the cockpit. There's mm -hmm. no room for him. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, they fall against those ranges and we need to move, use our moving averages in the same way. They give us a flavor of what is, but until you really look at price and go, wait, that wasn't supposed to happen. I need to look at that. So what do you do? You put an alert about maybe a dollar away, seeing, I mean, average, something like that, whatever percentage you want to go in front of where you think the stop ought to be. When it goes off, get yeah. in there and start looking. Yeah. And that gives you advance notice. A lot yeah. of us trade and we're like, oh, that just happened. I think I need to do this. And that's not, that's not a mechanic for good execution. Yeah. The mechanic for good execution is constantly observe and orient and then say, oh, I need to observe again and orient again. And then maybe I need to decide on a particular flow. The moment we get to the space where we go, I'm going to look proactively at what's happening in my chart, you're going to feel a sense of power that you didn't feel before. Many times we just go in and we go, oh, let's see what it's doing today. Oh, and we don't do any uh, of that deductive or inductive reasoning that says, wait, should it have done that? Mm -hmm. We normally go in and go, oh, man, I had a great day or, oh, that looks terrible. Mm -hmm. Right. But we don't go, wait, why is that look terrible? Sometimes we're so busy making money that we don't even think about well, what might happen if this thing's done? And yeah. that's the next thing right. Right. because we wake up and we go, oh man, that was up 20% and now it's up three or whatever. <laughs> and then, but you know, you don't, you don't think about it in a relationship manner. You think about it as in, oh, I see what's going on right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, to your point, the early alerts are so important. I mean, you, you really yes. want to kind of get a sense that your engine is overheating before it catches on fire. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. um, exactly. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.